Turn to John chapter 6, verse uh, 55. And this is a message that the Lord has placed on my heart really since the beginning of the pandemic. When the pandemic broke out, just waiting on the Lord, I felt like this message was probably one of the number one things I feel like the Lord was speaking. One of the things the Lord was saying is in John chapter 6, verse 55, is the Lord is speaking to his church, come to me. That is what I believe the Lord is saying to his church right now. Come to me. And, you know, there's so many things God is saying, I believe, and there's so much going on. I mean, our world has been turned upside down. Hopefully you can see that. But, I mean, we're in just, it, I mean, I never have been in a time like this in my life. There's so much craziness going on, and the church is just searching for answers. And, you know, we want something more complicated. We want the solution, and Jesus himself is the solution. And I believe the Lord is saying to his church, come to me. And so this is going to be the, the last message in the John chapter 6 series. But, you know, if you, if you look at, if you, if you search the word come to me, the phrase come to me in the Gospels, you see the Lord use it several times. But here in John 6.35, the Lord says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will not thirst. So the Lord is looking for, you know, the Lord is just looking for this, the simplicity of coming to him. The simplicity of just coming to him. That intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what he's looking for. That's what he's after. He's after intimacy with his people. He's after that deep, communing, abiding, experiential intimacy with the person of Jesus Christ. He's inviting you. He's inviting me. He's inviting the church right now into that place of deep communion and intimacy with him. It's time to go deeper in the Lord. It's time to go deeper in Him. The people who know their God will display strength and take action. It's the people who know God intimately that take action. I want to encourage you, don't waste this opportunity the Lord has given us with this quarantine. And we're kind of out of it now, but, you know, who knows where it's going. Don't waste this opportunity to get to know the Lord deeper. That's what he's calling us to. He is the bread of life. He is the meal. He is what we eat of. He is what we partake of. He is the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. See, we are so hungry, if, and when, when things are stripped away, and thing, you know, it seems as if things are being stripped away, it reveals to us the hunger that is in our heart. There is a hunger in all of our hearts that can only be satisfied by the person of Jesus Christ. We must have Him. We must have the person of Jesus Christ. He is the bread of life. The Lord is calling and he's saying, deep calls unto deep at the sound of the waterfalls, at the sound of his voice, deep calls unto deep. There is a deep call from the heart of God to his people, come into a place of intimacy with him. Mary of Bethany, this one thing you have chosen will never be taken away from you. Sitting at the Lord's feet listening to his words that is available to us all the time if we want it now let's turn to Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 and we're, we're looking at the theme of come to me Matthew 11 verse 28 I love this we're, we're, we're in our home group, we're studying in our home groups the book of Galatians, and we've, you know, the book of Galatians deals with the law, is the Galatians were 
were, had started off good, and you probably know this by now, but they started off good, but then Judaizers came to Galatia, and they started preaching to Galatia, you must be circumcised to be right with God. You must obey the external commandments given to Moses to be right with God. The 613 commandments were given by Moses, you must obey all of those and, you know, Paul called, Paul called it, and the apostles called the law a heavy yoke. And Jesus is going to allude to this in here in Matthew chapter 11. Again, he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Lord is not, this is, you know, this, let me just understand this. The Lord is not saying to people who are tired from working hard during the week. He's not talking about, you know, people who've been, you know, with, caught up with their parenting and quarantine and with their kids all week and you're worn out from your kids, you're worn out from your work week. The Lord's not talking about that kind of heaviness and that kind of burden. He's talking about a people and a culture who were weighed down and yoked to the heavy burden of the law. Is the heavy burden of the law weighed them down? And you know, you've seen a yoke. It's, it's a wooden piece that ties two animals together to help, like oxen, to help them become more productive. And so what was happening to ancient Israel, they were yoked together with the law. And you can just imagine, and, and the apostles talked about this, this yoke, they said, has been unbearable for us to keep and our forefathers to keep since the beginning. We cannot keep this heavy yoke. That's what the Lord's talking about. And I'll just apply it to us. The Lord's saying, you know, if you are tired of trying to be in this performance-based Christianity where you have to have meticulous obedience to God to be accepted by Him, which is what the law was dictating, where you have to just perform perfectly or else God's mad at you, that's a heavy yoke that you can exchange for the light and the easy yoke of Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. You are not justified. You are not right. You are not accepted by God. You are not declared righteous by what you do for Him, by how well you obey Him, by how much you pray and how much you fast and how much you tithe or whatever, whatever the, the task would be, whatever the external commandment is. You are, none of that makes you right with God. See, you don't obey God for acceptance. You don't obey God for righteousness. You don't obey God for approval. You don't obey God for love. You obey God from love. You obey God from righteousness. You obey God from acceptance and from approval. That is justification. And the Lord is saying to a group of people, he's saying to us, but he was saying in the first century to a, to a group of people worn out by trying to perform for God so that he would like them, so he would approve of them, so they could be righteous. This struggle and this strive to be perfect. The Lord's saying, that's not what I've called you to. I've called you to be yoked together with me in a relationship. Now think about this, when two animals are yoked together, what happens? It places you face to face with the other animal. Being yoked to Jesus places us face to face with him. That's what he's called you to, an intimate, deeply personal relationship with him that comes out of the secret place. He says, come to me. If you're tired, if you're worn out from trying to always feel like God's always mad at you, if you're tired and worn out from feeling like you've got to be absolutely meticulously perfect or else God is angry, the Lord is inviting you to say, that is not me. That's the law. You're still operating under the law. I've got a new way. I've got a new system. I've got an entirely new era of living that I've called you into, and it's called being yoked together with me in a relationship, a face-to-face -face intimate relationship where the yoke is easy and the burden is light. 
That's beautiful. I mean, how incredible, how kind the Lord is. How, you know, the, the one thing about the Lord that, that we always seem to miss is how deeply relational the Lord is. The Lord is so relational. The Lord just wants you to just be with Him, to know Him intimately. You know, we immediately try, a lot of times we come to the Lord, and the first thing we do is we have our reading plan. And you're probably going to blame me for that, but that's okay. But we have our reading plan. Well, Brian says we've got to read Galatians, you know, and all that. Now, that's still important. Don't, don't abandon that. And we come to the Lord with our prayer list, or we come to the Lord with all these things of what we want to see accomplished. And just sometimes the Lord wants us to come to Him with no agenda but Himself. I mean, you know, you, have you, I don't know if you've tried that before. Sometimes you, you got to be careful because you'll fall asleep if you don't, aren't careful because God doesn't want to put you to sleep. <laughs> but coming to the Lord without an agenda, coming to the Lord without a prayer list, coming to the Lord without a plan, coming to the Lord like, Lord, I don't even know where you're taking me right now. I don't know where you're directing me right now, but I'm going to wait on you. Lord, what are you speaking? What are you saying? This is, listen, this is an hour of urgency to the church. This is an hour when we must wait on him. I mean, we live in urgent, critical times. I think you know that. But our solution, we cannot go back to Christianity as we have known it. We've got to go on with Him. We've got to wait on Him. Lord, what are you speaking? Lord, what are you saying? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God wants to take a sledgehammer to this perfectionist-based performance-based Christianity that we've come under. That, that, that I'm not just talking about us. I mean, in general, where if I don't obey all 16, 613 commandments of the law, all the external commandments that God gives, then he's mad. He's upset. I'm, you know, it's this whole idea of, God, I've got to be perfect. God is just saying, take that heavy yoke off of your shoulders, I'm not calling you to be perfect. I'm calling you to be with me. And when you are with me, I will transform you and I will conform you into my image. Stop trying to be perfect. Be conformed into my image by resting in me, by abiding in me. My life in you is what is going to make you Christ-like, not your performance. The Lord says here, I will give you rest. This is not talking about physical rest. It's not talking about a time where you go take a nap or whatever. This is about a Sabbath rest for your soul. Be still and know that I am God. Psalms 46.10. And you can actually look into the Hebrew. Some of the other translations would be, let go and relax and know that I am God. That place of quiet communion with the Lord, that place of internal intimacy with Him, when your soul and what's raging in your mind and the emotions swirling around, which I'm sure we have many of those right now, those, down, those come down and we wait on him. Lord, what are you saying? What are you speaking? Come to me. Come to me. Verse 29. Take my yoke upon you. Just imagine that for a second. The Lord... And you and the Lord yoke together face to face with Him. Instead of working for God, you're working with God. That's a huge, trans uh, huge transition. The yoke that places you face to face with Jesus, that's what He's after. And then He says, Learn from me. This is so beautiful. This is what God is after right here. 
The, the King James Version says, learn of me. Paul talked about in Ephesians, he says, you have not learned Christ in this way. T. Austin Sparks referred to this as the school of Christ. It's so beautiful. Catch this. The Lord doesn't want to just teach you Sunday school lessons about the person of Jesus Christ. He wants to reveal to you himself in the school of Christ to know him intimately, deeply, and personally, experientially, to know the Lord deeply. And I've shared this dream a hundred times here. I've just shared one hundred and one times. Is in 1996, the Lord, and I, I don't have a lot of dreams, uh, especially now, because I feel like all I ever do is snore. I've gotten, I guess, getting older, I just snore all the time, and Angie has to pretty much just not knock me over like three times in the night. <laughs> Stop snoring. But in 1996, when I didn't snore like I used to, and I used to dream more, I had a dream, and the Lord appeared to me in the dream, and the Lord was so humble. And I've shared it before, you know, the, the, in the movies we see, he was not that Italian movie star that looked so incredibly handsome that everyone was drawn to. He was extremely, extremely ordinary, extremely just humble. And I just, you know, but he was also beautiful. And he was also gracious. And he looked at me and he said, Brian, my people do not know me. And I remember just thinking about that. He wasn't talking about the world who's going, you know, not saved. He was talking about his church. The grief that was in his heart, I can't even articulate it. Just the grief, the burden in the Lord's heart. My people do not know me. Now, obviously, he was first talking to me back in 1996. I mean, back then you're young and you're like, okay, well, you know, you guys don't know the Lord. And I was like, no, not exactly, Brian. I'm talking to you first. You don't know me. You have no authority to go out. And I did that probably. And I had a dream from God. You don't know the Lord. And the Lord's like, no, you, Brian, don't know me. <laughs> but I look back, what is that, 20-something years, whatever the number is, 25 years later, and I'm like, that is so true. The church does not know the Lord. The church does not know the Lord intimately and how the Lord longs for us to know him intimately. And you know the parable of the ten virgins. Five were wise and five were foolish. The five wise virgins got oil for their lamps. And the Lord said to the five foolish virgins, or you could say the five foolish Christians like dad coined the phrase for, is he told them, you don't, I don't know you. An omniscient God was not saying he doesn't know who they are. He was saying, I don't know you intimately. See, the Lord is inviting us, come to me. Come to me. Know me. Back in verse 29, the Lord says again, learn from me. I think you can take this in one of two ways, and I think both are valid. Number one, learn from me, is the Lord himself becomes our teacher. He teaches us about himself. He teaches us about what's going on in the world. He teaches us from his word. He teaches us how to do our job. He teaches us how to parent. He teaches us all those different things because he's humble and he's meek, because that's his nature. He just loves to share and teach. I think that's a very valid way to read the scripture. But I think the other valid way is when it says, learn of me, is he wants to bring us into the school of Christ where we don't have Sunday school lessons about him and we don't know all the, this is far beyond having good doctrine and being able to, you know, know the different books of the Bible. All of that is important, but this is something deeper than that. It's the school of Christ to learn of him. Again, Paul said in Ephesians 4, you did not learn Christ in this way. Not about him, but him. And so he says, for I am, he, my translation says gentle, but it's actually meek. For I am meek 
and humble in heart. The Lord is so humble. The Lord is so meek. And that's one of the things that makes him so absolutely beautiful and attractive, his meekness, his humility, his desire to be in a deep personal relationship with you. Not something Sunday schoolish, not something that's just Christianese that we say, hey, whatever, we, we talk about just, you know, just Christianese. A real personal experience with him. He says, you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, God does not want us to be yoked to a tablet of stone. God does not want us to be ex, you know, yoked to a set of morality. We're going to keep moral commandments and you know, this whole Christian thing of we're going to be moral people. Now, I'm not saying by any means be immoral, obviously, but all that, the morality and the purity and the holiness flows out of an intimacy with the Lord. I'm not saying any of that. But we were never called to be yoked to Ten Commandments. We were never called to be yoked to external commandments. We were called to be yoked to a person in an intimate, internal relationship with him. See, when we come to the Lord, we're not coming to Jesus who is in heaven. I mean, how can you be intimate with someone in heaven? You're, we're, I'm talking about an intimacy with Christ who dwells in you. And him, then the spirit connects you to Jesus who dwells in heaven. You see, as we have you know, I've got to remind myself of this all the time. We have this, the very Spirit of Christ who rose Jesus from the dead, lives and dwells inside of us. I've got to remind myself of this every single day because I forget. But you are, you are already joined to him. <laughs> you know, a lot of times we feel like, I just don't feel that close to God right now. I just don't feel like I'm near to him. Well, that is your emotion speaking because your spirit and his spirit are one. You're listening right now to your emotions, and they're lying to you, and they're saying you're not close to him. Well, the truth of Scripture says I am one spirit with him, and because I am one spirit with him, I can come to him any moment, any time, and have intimacy with him. It's beautiful. Paul, and, and we're looking at this in Galatians I love what Paul said. He said, when God was pleased to reveal his son in me. And this is Paul, the one who had the most dramatic external revelation of Jesus Christ. When God the Son appeared to him like blazing sunlight, knocked him to the ground off his horse. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I mean, Saul had an external revelation of Jesus. Saul, Paul, he says in Galatians, when, his, when the Father was pleased to reveal his Son in me. Paul's basically saying, you don't have to have a Damascus Road experience like I had to encounter Christ. See, this takes the, the burden off of us. So often I thought, okay, you know, just to be honest with you, I, growing up so often I thought, okay, growing up in the Lord, I thought, okay, if only I had more dreams and visions... If only I had more prophetic encounters. If only I had more experience as a supernatural. And then, I'll, I'll never forget just listening to Terry Bennett speak, and he probably has more prophetic experiences than anyone I've ever heard of, say he would give all of that up for an internal relationship with the Lord. I'm like, what? Showing me that, wow, I have already the Spirit of God in me. I don't need a ton of prophetic external experiences. I'll take those. I, I will absolutely take those. I would love to have more of those. But I don't need that to know the Lord intimately. I can know Him. You can know Him because He dwells in you. Because God Himself dwells in you by the Holy Spirit. You can know Him. You don't have to have this experience, this encounter, this angelic appearance. You can know the Lord by the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's good news. That's good news, isn't it? 
is we don't have to have this encounter or go to this place. We can just go to our, our, the secret place, get alone with him, get quiet before him, and commune with him face to face. Paul prayed in Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. Paul prayed that you might have a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation in the knowledge of him. That word knowledge, this is, this is where the Greek is so powerful. That word knowledge means a true and a precise knowledge that comes out of relational experience. The Lord has invited you into a relational experience with him where you would come to the knowledge of God that's true that's precise, that's accurate, that's absolutely who he is. See, the Lord said, and in, in t- talking about the end times, he said, many people are going to come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they're going to, de- to deceive many. Now, I used to read that and think, okay, you know, I, I just was like, okay, how are people going to really be deceived? There's this guy in a white outfit with a beard, with a staff saying, I'm Jesus Christ, come worship me. How many people, is it going to be that bad that people are going to really literally be deceived by Jesus, by someone claiming is Jesus Christ? And then I realized, no, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about uh, pastors, leaders, people like me, hopefully not me, but people like me, leaders, pastors, teachers, teachers of the Bible, prophets, apostles, uh, you know, influencers, whatever the, the terminology would be, coming in the name of Jesus Christ and saying something about Jesus Christ that is not accurate. He's saying that's the deception you have to be aware of. The guard against that deception is that we know the Lord for ourselves. I'm telling you, the day and hour we live in, we, we must know the Lord for ourselves and not the fake imposter Jesus, the, like Paul called it, another Jesus that's being preached. There is another Jesus being preached in America. There is another Jesus being preached in the world. And the the safeguard against being deceived by another Jesus is knowing him internally by the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Coming to him, waiting on him to know him. See, what, what I'm talking about is not head knowledge that comes through intellectual study. Now, there is a place for that. There is a place to study scripture. That's part of what we're doing even in our home groups. That's an important thing to do. But what I'm talking about is even greater than that, greater than intellectual study. This is about your heart growing larger. This is about your heart growing larger and you coming into a deeper revelation of him by experience. So let me, let, let me paraphrase Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Just real quick, just to, just to bring it, just to kind of summarize it, solidify it into our hearts. If you are tired of always trying to perform for God, where you feel like it's never enough, where you feel like I can never do enough, I can never obey enough, that I've got to be absolutely perfect or God's mad at me, where I got to be absolutely right on or God is not approving of me. Again, I'm not talking about a lawlessness or any of that, but this meticulous law-keeping drive where I've got to obey him perfectly. The Lord wants to release us from that, this performance-based Christianity of always trying to meet some standard that's way up here to be perfect. That's not what God is wanting to do. You'll never get there. And if you do, you're going to be so judgmental and critical of everyone else who's not where you are. The Lord hasn't called us to that. He's called us into a relationship. Now, he will bring us there internally, but it's not by self-effort. It's not by gritting our teeth. It is not by using our our greatest force of determination, saying we're going to grit our teeth and obey him. No, it comes by abiding in him. Paul said, you've died to the law. You've died to the external commandments. You've died trying to be perfect by external obedience. 
so that you might bear fruit for another, so that you, because you have been joined to him, so that we might bear fruit for God. Again, I'm not talking about, some people can take this and mean, oh, you're teaching lawlessness. Absolutely not. That's the last thing in the world I would ever teach, hopefully. <laughs> you know, and Paul said it like this. He said, he said that be careful that the yoke, that being set free and your freedom in Christ does not become an opportunity for the flesh. So I'm not talking about an opportunity for the flesh. I'm talking about this heavy yoke that weighs on people that says, I've got to be perfect. You'll never be that way apart from him. It's a, it's a living, abiding relationship with Christ. And so the Lord is saying, is, is I'm inviting you to take that yoke of heaviness, of perfectionism, that I've got to do all this stuff to make God happy and take my yoke on you and come to me imperfect as you are. With all your flaws... Jesus accepting you absolutely perfectly and saying you are righteous. I declare you righteous. You are justified in my sight. That our obedience comes from justification, not for justification. To where we come to him in that deeply intimate personal relationship with him. And we don't just learn about him, we learn of him. And learning of him and that intimacy, we take his yoke on us that's light and easy. And we work together with him face to face. It's beautiful. That's the relationship he's called you into. So I want to talk just real quick. I always say real quick, and it takes a lot longer than I think. God is calling you, God is calling me into a holy of holies relationship with him. God does not want us to be in the outer court. God does not want us to be in the holy place. God wants us to be intimate with him in the holy of holies. To know him spirit to spirit in the holy of holies. See, under the old covenant, you know, you know this, under the old covenant, the high priest had to take all the sacrifices and he could only go into the holy of holies one time, and that was one time a year for the atonement of sins. Now in Jesus Christ, the veil has been torn down. You have access to God to draw near to him at any moment, at any time. You don't have to come to church to do that. You have him inside of you. Your spirit is the holy of holies of the temple. Think about that. Think about what a first century Jew would have thought about when Paul said, don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God dwells inside of you? Oh my goodness. We don't even have an idea what that was like. But to the Jew, the temple was everything to the first century Jews. To the, even going further in history, it was everything. The temple, the whole lifestyle of the country revolved around that temple. And Paul looked at the Corinthians who were heathenistic, who were filled Filled with heathenism and, and idolatry and immorality. And he says, don't you know when you were born again, you became a temple of the living God. Wow. The temple had three parts, outer court, inner court, holy of holies. Paul is basically saying your body's like the outer court. Your soul is like, or your soul is like the, the holy place. And your, your spirit is like the holy of holies. This is beautiful. You can have right now a holy of holies relationship with Jesus where he becomes the meal you eat. He becomes the bread you eat. He is the life you partake of. So let's, let's look at Revelation chapter, chapter 2 verse 17. The Lord is talking to the church, and he's talking to those who have, are in compromise, but I want us to get the point here of what he's inviting us into. He says, to him who overcomes, I will give you some of the hidden manna. Okay, you might read that and go, okay, 
You're, you're trying to motivate me right now? Okay. You're trying to motivate me to overcome my compromise by giving me hidden manna? Well, I don't even, the Israelites, Israelites didn't even like manna. I mean, they were complaining about it from the moment they started eating of it. And you want to give me something that's hidden? Okay, why would that motivate me? See, the Lord is not offering us the manna that the Israelites tasted of in the wilderness. The hidden manna was put into the Ark of the Covenant, and that Ark of the Covenant was taken into the Holy of Holies. So only the high priest would see the Ark of the Covenant one time a year. What the Lord is inviting us into when He says the hidden manna is He's saying, I am the bread of life. And you are invited into a holy of holies relationship with me. Now, ultimately, that, that's talking about eternity, but it begins right now because you have the holy of holies inside of you right now. Your spirit is the holy of holies of God's temple. You already have access to him in your spirit. You can part, begin to partake of that hidden manna right now in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life. See, when what we're talking about here is partaking of Christ, eating of Christ, drinking of Christ, to where Christ is all and our all in all. More than Bible study, more than prayer lists, more than intercession, the, a deeply personal, intimate relationship with the person of Jesus Christ in the Holy of Holies, not an outer court relationship. So much of the church has an outer court relationship. They know about him. They know what he did. They know doctrines. They know all these different things. But God is interested in something way more personal, way more intimate, way deeper than that. Come to me. That's his invitation. You are invited to. I am invited to. An intimate relationship with the person of Jesus Christ through the indwelling Holy Spirit. A holy of holies relationship with him. Now let's turn to Revelation 3 verse 20. Again the Lord is speaking to the church. I believe he's speaking this very scripture to the church in America right now. Saying, behold I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. I hope you realize how sad this is. Jesus is outside of his own church. He's looking at the church going, wow, you can really run my church so well. I believe he's saying the same thing to the American church right now during this pandemic. Either Tozer or I think it was Tozer, or I believe, or Leonard Ravenhill said that in most churches today, if God the Holy Spirit was removed, most of them would not even know it. The Lord, outside of his church, knocking to come in. That's, I don't know about you, that's sad to me. I don't want it, to, I don't ever want that to be true of this church or us, ever. I want the Lord to always be welcomed. Always be welcomed. But here's what he says if you hear my voice, his knock is his voice. If you hear my voice and open up to me, I will come in and I will dine with you and he with me. See, the Lord is inviting the church into an intimate dining experience with him. Now, ultimately, this is talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. But right now, we can have a dining communion relationship with him. I just want to just, just encourage you, this truly is possible for you. It's not just reserved for the super spiritual. It's not just reserved for leaders or whatever. You can have a communing dining experience with a person of Jesus Christ today. You don't have to wait and die and go to heaven to have that. You can have it right now, communing with him, conversational intimacy with him. 
where you wait on him and you hear, okay, Lord, what are you speaking? What are you saying? What do you want to do? You come to him without an agenda. You come to him without a prayer list. You come to him without even a Bible reading plan. And, and, and if he says, well, Brian, if you say, Brian told me, then I'm sure he's going to come back to me and have a word with me. But still, you get the point. You come to him without an agenda to experience him. And what you find out is how relational the Lord is. How all the stuff we've been doing in what's called the church or Christianity is just a bunch of formulas and external things. The Lord is not in, in so much of it. The Lord wants his church to dine with him. You think about dining with someone. It's the most incredible place where you let down your guard. Just think about when you eat with someone I mean, you pretty much pour out your heart to them, don't you? You share everything with them, right? So you, you pour your heart out to them over dinner or lunch or whatever. And, you know, unfortunately, we haven't been able to eat a lot of times now in restaurants because of the quarantine or whatever. But still, you know, you go to a restaurant and bef uh, before the pandemic hit, you go to a restaurant and you eat with people. You go even in your house. And, and just you let down your guards. You're real with people. You have this intimacy, this friendship where you share your heart and they share their heart with you. It's a conversation that you have with the other people you're eating with. Every one of there's not anyone that doesn't like, I don't think, doing that. Who knows? I love it. I love to eat and I love to talk. So I love both. But the Lord is inviting us into this. Dine with me. Dine with me. And you're like, well, how do I even do it? It's, it's one of those things, just come to him and say, Lord, here I am. And make sure you don't fall asleep because, you know, you'll be tempted to. But come to him, dine with him, hear him, share your heart, listen, share your heart, listen, share your heart. It's this fellowship that God's calling us into. Come to me. To bring this to a close... When we dine with Jesus, Jesus himself is the meal we eat. Jesus himself is the lamb. We see this in John 6. Jesus himself is the bread. Jesus himself is the wine. We're partaking of the person, not just a book. We're partaking of the person of Jesus Christ. He is the meal we're eating. He is the meal we're partaking of. He is the drink we're drinking in. Him, learn of me, come to me. In John chapter 6, the Lord talks about, in John chapter 6, I'm just going to just run through this pretty quick. Just listing out in John chapter 6 the different things he calls us to. He, he calls us to come to him to experience intimacy with him. John 6.35. He calls us to believe in him to experience rest in our souls. John 6.29. He, uh, he calls to us, eat of him to experience satisfaction in our hearts. John 6.35. He calls us to drink of him to experience refreshment in our souls. John 6, 35. He calls us to behold him to experience a revelation of who he truly is. John 6, 40. He calls us to abide in him to experience constant connection with his life. John 6, 56. He calls us to live by him that we might experience an overcoming life. John 6, 57. I'll email these notes out later. Come to me. Believe in me. Eat of me. Drink of me. Behold me. Abide in me. This all-encompassing life that Jesus calls us into. The abiding life. Dining with him. Intimacy with him. And the last thing I'll say is the one thing we've realized during this pandemic is I've heard the excuse so often. I've been talking, I've been trying to invite people into intimacy with God for years. And the number one excuse I always hear is, I just don't have the time. I just don't have the time. And I understood before the pandemic, and I realized, okay, yeah, you, you eight-hour work, two-hour commute, whatever. 
man, I get it, I get it. You know, you got kids or whatever. Now the quarantine hits, and it, re it has revealed to me it's, that is no longer an excuse. The valid thing is, if we're just being honest, is it's not that I don't have the time, it's that I don't make the time. See, I think that excuse has been taken away, right? Now we see I haven't made the time. And if we haven't made the time, then we need to pray to the Lord, say, Lord, give me that hunger. It's the hungry and the thirsty that go to him. It's the hungry and the thirsty that partake of him. It's the see, if you're filled up with the world and you're filled up with things and you're filled up with all this other stuff, then you're just like in the natural. You're not going to eat. You're not going to drink because you're already are full. See, there's so many things that have, uh, that have come into us to, to take away our attention, to take away our, our focus. And so the Lord would say, the, the issue is not you don't have the time. The issue is you're not hungry and thirsty enough. That's the real issue. Is we want to say, Lord, make me hungry Make me thirsty. And, and the thing is, is if you start praying that, you'll start realizing, man, you just feel like, okay, this stuff doesn't satisfy me anymore. And you got to be very careful because you can get into a funk not realizing, okay, no, this is God answering my prayer. The solution is not to go try to fill it with another, a bunch of other stuff. The, the solution is to actually come to him, partake of him, eat of him, dine with him, experience him, abide in him. That is the solution. See, but if we're not aware of that, we'll just be like, man, I feel depressed. I just feel, I just feel like, you know, things have been taken away. And I don't know, I just don't feel like myself anymore. Well, maybe God is allowing you to be hungry and thirsty. But we've developed a habit of not coming to him that the last thing we do is come to him. And so we start getting and we start feeling depressed and we start feeling sad and we start feeling all these other emotions. Well, maybe that was a gift from the Lord showing you, you are, you're hungry and you're thirsty. Fill, let it be filled with him, with him, the person of Christ. Well, it's Father's Day and I could, I have the, because I'm celebrating Father's Day, I can do whatever I want. So maybe I'll talk for 15 or, no, just kidding. We have hamburgers waiting and I, I'm getting hungry. Speaking of hunger, and uh, we'll bring this to a close. I just want to encourage us. The, the Lord has put it on my heart to take the month of July to really wait on him, to really just spend time coming to him without an agenda, coming to him to know him, wait on him, dine with him, experience him. And, and so that's what God has put on my heart. And I just want to invite you in, into that as well. This just, just take the month of July and instead of doing all the other stuff you might do, how about putting him in the first place that we're going to just, we're going to spend the highest priority in July is to come to him. And everything we do that comes out of that is, it will be great. But my priority in July is to come to him. My priority in July is to wait on him. Lord, what are you speaking and what are you saying? I believe it's a, it's a, it's a time we desperately need as we get ready to go forward in the new season. Amen. God bless. Amen.